That's what God wants us to be here in Memphis, Tennessee. We need to be a catalyst for spiritual awakening, and we do that by loving Jesus Christ. Good morning and thanks for joining us for today's program. Today, we'll be picking back up in our series through the book of Acts. Have your Bibles ready and join us as we learn how God worked through the New Testament church. We'll also be joining Donna Gaines for her spring Bible study series, Home Builders, Embracing the Art of the Home. And we'll enjoy some great worship from our choir, orchestra, and worship band. And if you're looking for encouragement to get through the week or want to catch up on recent messages, go online and check out our audio and video on demand at Bellevue.org. You can also follow us on social at Bellevue Memphis throughout the week for inspirational and encouraging stories. I'll see you in just a few minutes with more information about today's program and how you can get connected right here at Bellevue.
each week, our ladies come together for a time of encouragement, worship, and Bible study led by Donna Gaines and other gifted teachers, and you are always welcome. This semester, we are learning how to skillfully build stable homes and how to establish them on a righteous foundation. Stay with us for the next few minutes for our study on home builders, embracing the art of the home. What's the greatest command? I've got it on your hand out there, <clears throat> Mark chapter 12. What are we to do? To love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it tells us the second is likened to it. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, if I'm going to love my neighbor as much as I love myself, I am not going to be able to sleep at night if I think my neighbor is hungry or my neighbor is not getting good, get good education or my neighbor is going to be evicted from their home or my neighbor is sick and has no medicine or my neighbor doesn't have clothing for their child I'm not going to be able to rest if I'm going to really love my neighbor like I love myself because I would not allow myself or my family members to go without those things if there was any way I could help it I would do whatever I needed to do to meet that need so I need to do it for my neighbor as well so if I'm going to love the Lord, if I have this all-consuming love for him, which heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's pretty much it, isn't it? That pretty much sums it all up. If I'm going to love him with that all-consuming love, I'm going to then have his heart of compassion for others. And if I have his heart of compassion, then I'm going to open not only my heart and my life, but my home to others as well. That second command, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And what did Jesus say? There is no other commandment greater than these so if those are the two greatest commandments and there's none greater than that how well are we doing at obeying those two commands are you opening your life and opening your home one of the great books on hospitality that I read recently and Dana had it in our additional resources as well as the simplest way to change the world biblical hospitality as a way of life it's written by two church planters and it's it is really excellent but they said in a culture where busyness is prized where isolation is rampant and where blinking devices replace genuine relationships hospitality offers a beautiful and countercultural rebellion one of the most countercultural things you can do is have an entire conversation with someone without checking your phone <laughs> So I want to encourage you, when you have people in your home, just ask everybody to leave their cell phones someplace else. Silence them, put them away somewhere so that you can actually have eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball conversations. How many times have you been out to a restaurant and you've seen people sitting at a table or sitting in a booth or a couple facing each other? And what are they doing? They're staring at their devices. They're not conversing with one another. And so we need to make an agreement, have an agreement. If I'm going to lunch with you, they, the, the uh, phone stays in the purse or it stays on silent we only check it if there's an emergency now I realize those of you who have children you have to check every once in a while make sure they're okay that you don't they don't need you uh, something hasn't happened at school or that one of them's gotten sick I get that but we don't need to just be focused on these blinking devices we need to be paying attention eyeball to eyeball, to eyeball face to face with the people that we're spending time with do you realize that loneliness depression and anxiety have skyrocketed since the increase in social media usage, I know there is a link. And so we, we've got to get back to relating with people as people. Cyber relationships are pseudo relationships. We understand that, right? <laughs> You've got to touch somebody, be life on life, eyeball to eyeball to really relate and connect. And we've talked about entertaining versus, versus hospitality. And this definition came from this book, Open Heart, Open Home, that I have had for probably 20 or 30 years. It is an excellent book on hospitality. But Karen Main says, entertaining says, I want to impress you with my beautiful home, my clever decorating, my gourmet cooking. Hospitality, however, seeks to minister. It says, this home is not my own. It is truly a gift from my master. I am his servant, and I use it as he desires. Hospitality does not try to impress, but to serve. How are they going to know if we don't open our arms to them and love them and welcome them in the name of Jesus Christ? If we don't build that bridge, we have no access to their heart, no right to share the gospel if we're not willing to love them first. Because that's what Jesus has called us to. Love the Lord and then love your neighbor. And if you love your neighbor, you're going to share Jesus with them and you're going to open your life to them. In the simplest way to change the world, those young men went on to say, we've fallen into the conventional thinking that a big mission 
demands big tactics. But we forget that in the economy of God's kingdom, big does not beget big. It's precisely the opposite. The overwhelming message of Jesus' life and teaching is that small begets big. Because some of us have a tendency to think, well, that's fine. She's the pastor's wife. She's supposed to have conversations like that. God's going to bring those people to her. No, no, no. All God wants is a willing vessel. And the smaller we think we are, the greater he can use us. Consider God's plan to redeem creation, big, is achieved through his incarnation as an impoverished baby, small. Christ seeks to make disciples of all nations, big, and he starts with a handful of fishermen, small. Even Goliath, big, is defeated by David with a few stones, small. So lest you say, I have nothing to offer, all you need to offer is yourself and your little abode, whatever it may be. Married, single, widowed, it doesn't matter. Whoever you are, wherever you are, open your life, open your home, open your heart to the Lord and to others and see what God will do. Katie Davis, who wrote Kisses from Katie, said, I will not change the world. Jesus will do that. I can, however, let him use me to change the world for one person. All of us can at least reach one. All of us can at least reach one family or one individual that we can love, we can pray for, we can open our hearts and our homes to and see what God will do. Listen to some stats from our city. Got me thinking this week. In Memphis, 44.7% of our children currently live in poverty. It's almost half of the children that live within our city limits. But Memphis has 815 religious venues for a population of just over 655,000. That's one for every 804 people. Let me tell you how many Baptist churches. Now, I looked at a list online of all the churches broken down by denomination, and I went after just the most conservative ones that might be willing to do my proposal. Okay, we have 180 churches, Southern Baptist churches in the Mid-South Baptist Association, 30 Methodist, 10 non-denom, 6 Pentecostal, 15 Presbyterian, 10 United Methodist, 79 Church of God, 39 Church of Christ, 4 Assemblies of God, 7 Bible churches, 38 Church of God in Christ, Just those alone for a total of 418 churches. If just those 418 churches had 10 families who would befriend a family, that's going to be 4,180 families that can be changed with the gospel of Jesus Christ because we're willing to intentionally reach outside the walls of our church and our home and impact another family for Jesus Christ. Not only that, right now in Shelby County, there are 748 children in foster care. If just two people in these 814 churches would foster a child, there would not be a child without a home and a family loving on them. And where better for them to be than in a Christian home that can share the gospel with them. We are called by God to go to the least of these. And what did he say in Matthew 25? When you do it to the least of these, who are we doing it to? to Jesus. So when you serve, not only are you doing it in his name, you're doing it to him. How incredible is that? That that is how he views what we're doing. Go back to Luke 14, 12 through 14. And what did the Lord say? Who did he say we're to invite? Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. God is going to hold us accountable for what we have done with the resources he has given us. And to whom much is given, much is required. We know this, but are we living it? by now they'd fall but you have never failed me yet waiting for change 
much to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. The promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your. faith this morning.
You know, it's amazing how busy people are and how busy people make themselves. And even though we have all these electronic gadgets to help us save time and to master our time, we still seem to be busier than we have ever been before. I want you to take a look sometime on the front of your bulletin and it shows a man with a cell phone, a cell phone. Has anything taken up more of our time than a cell phone? We email, we text, we do social media, we call, we do everything in the world and we live on our cell phones and it eats up so much of our time. There are a lot of people in Memphis that seem to have time to do whatever they want to do, but they rarely find time for Jesus. There are a lot of people that stay out on Friday night and Saturday night, but cannot get up on Sunday morning to go to church. There are a lot of people that travel all over the country to watch their children play baseball, softball, basketball, soccer, or they watch them in cheerleading competition, but they don't have time, they say, to bring their children on a consistent basis to Sunday school, life groups, and worship. They have time for fishing and for hunting. They have time for golfing. They have time for going shopping, but they don't have time for the things of God. They have money to buy anything imaginable when it comes to clothing or gifts for their children or grandchildren. They have money to go to every kind of unsorted movie you can imagine, to concerts and to every kind of athletic event, but they have no money whatsoever for the kingdom of God. They find time to talk about politics they love to talk about the Olympics and every kind of sport known to man. They enjoy talking about the economy and whoever is the president, they enjoy putting him down. But they can't find time to talk about eternity. They can't find time to talk about sin and salvation. They can't find time to talk about the Bible. They just can't find time for Jesus. I wonder if I'm talking to you today. I wonder if you're one of those people, you have time for everything else, but you just barely give God just a little bit of your time. I want to say this to you. I warn you, you're going to spend a lot of time in either heaven or hell. You're going to spend eternity in either heaven or hell based on what you do with Jesus during this brief lifetime. I think it's very appropriate that on every tombstone, your life is represented not by a date, but by a dash. Birth date, death date, dash. You're dashing through life but are you really accomplishing what God wants you to accomplish? Are you really focused on the things of God? Are you making and finding time for Jesus? Maybe today God wants to give you a checkup. Maybe he wants to change your whole life. We're going to read about a man named Felix who had a hard time finding time for Jesus. Look there in Acts chapter 24. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders, with an attorney named Tertullus, and they brought charges to the governor against Paul. Now, what's going on here? You'll remember Paul had been arrested in the temple area. He had been taken by a mob, and Lysias and the Roman soldiers pulled him away from the mob, and the mob had accused them, but Paul tried to give a speech, and a further riot broke out when it was obvious that Paul believed that God loved the Gentiles as much as he loved the Jews. And then Paul was taken to Caesarea because 
He had, Lysias, the commander, had heard that 40 men were out to kill him and that they were not going to eat or drink until Paul was dead. So they took him away from Jerusalem where Paul, his life was literally in danger and so were all the Roman soldiers because of Paul. They sent him to be under the Roman governor who at that time was Felix. Verse 2, after Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying to the governor, since we have through you attained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation, we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. But that I may not weary you any further, I beg you to grant us by your kindness a brief hearing, for we have found this man, talking about Paul, a real pest." and a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. That's not very nice, is it? That's not a very good description of Christianity and their leader. And he even tried to desecrate the temple. That's a lie. And then we arrested him. We wanted to judge him according to our own law, but Lysias, the commander, came along and with much violence took him out of our hands, ordering his accusers to come before you. That's all a lie. They were beating Paul and trying to kill him. They weren't trying to give him a fair trial. By examining him, you yourself concerning, yourself, concerning all these matters, you will be able to ascertain the things of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the attack asserting that these things were so. When the governor had nodded for him, Paul, to speak, Paul responded, knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense, since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Neither in the temple, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot, nor can they prove to you the charges of which they now accuse me. This, But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience both before God and before men. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they should have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before them and the council, other than for this one statement which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead I am on trial before you today. But Felix, having a more exact knowledge about the way, that is about Christianity, put them off, saying, when Lysias, that's the commander, comes down, I will decide your case." Then he gave orders to the centurion for him, for Paul to be kept in custody and yet to have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewish, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he, Paul, was discussing, look at this, look at his sermon. He had a three-point sermon. Here it is. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. At the same time, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in 
prison. Very quickly, let me share with you, first of all, when you consider finding time for Jesus, whether or not you have time for Jesus, you can always see what we see here, and I call it divine preparation. God was preparing Felix's heart to repent of his sins and to give him the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. God prepares your heart today. God wants you to receive Jesus today. Look there in verse 22. But Felix, having a more exact knowledge about the way, about Christianity, put them off saying, when Lysias the commander comes, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. It's obvious that God was preparing for Felix to hear the gospel and hopefully to be saved. Look at verse 22. You'll find that Felix had a more exact knowledge of the way. Somehow, some way, God had made sure that Felix knew more about Christianity than those accusers of Paul, the Jewish accusers, had, did have. Somehow Felix knew about what they called the sect of the Nazarenes. Somehow they knew about, he knew about the ring leader, Paul, and he knew about the one that Paul was preaching, and that is the Lord Jesus these Jews did everything that they could do to malign Paul and to malign the gospel, but it was not to be because Felix understood more about the gospel, more about Christ and Christianity than they did, and so he put them off. What exactly did Felix know about the way? Well, we don't know exactly, but surely he knew some things about Christianity. Surely he had seen their peaceful lifestyles, and he understood that they were no real threat to the Roman government. He had seen also not just their peaceful lifestyles, but their righteous lifestyles. He knew that they walked with God. He knew that they were morally pure. He knew that these people were some of the best Roman citizens there were. So he had seen the way they had lived and he knew he had a more exact knowledge of the way. Maybe he had heard about Jesus' miracles. Who had not in that area? Maybe Felix had heard about Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus their families miraculously with one little boy's lunch. Maybe he had heard about the great resurrection of Lazarus there in Bethany just outside of Jerusalem. Everybody was talking about that. In fact, many people came to Christ because Lazarus was raised from the dead. Maybe he heard about Jesus' teachings. They were so radically different than the Romans' teachings. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Nobody talked like that except Jesus. Jesus said, love your enemies. Rome never talked about that. They killed their enemies. That's how they got the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, not by loving enemies but by killing enemies. And then what about being born again? Surely, surely Felix had heard about that. Regardless of what he knew, he had a more exact knowledge of the way. And he was about to be privileged to hear the entire gospel from the man who wrote half the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. Felix would hear the gospel from God's very best. God did not send a two-month-old Christian to witness to Felix. He sent the best he had because God wanted Felix to be saved. You can't help but see divine preparation. And you can also go back to Paul's life and see divine preparation in his life. How was it that Paul got saved? Well, he was a Jew. Therefore, he knew the Scriptures. Therefore, he had a messianic hope. And at least partially, he could have been open to somebody being the Messiah in his day. 
He also had the divine preparation, Paul did, of being there when Stephen, the deacon, was stoned to death. And in Acts chapter 7, we see that Peter gave a summary of the entire Old Testament and showed how it all pointed to Jesus Christ. And he saw how Stephen was praying when he was stoned to death. He heard with his own ears while he was holding the coats of the people that were literally beaten beating Stephen to death with their stones. He heard Stephen say, I see Jesus standing in heaven at the right hand of the Father. He heard all of that. And not only that, he one day on his way to Damascus to apprehend, that means to arrest the Jews who had become Christians there and had fled from Jerusalem. While he was on the way, Jesus himself appeared to him. Oh, he had divine preparation. And then when he went to Straight Street at the house of Judas, he'd been blind for three days. God sent him a soul winner and he gave him the gospel. Let me tell you something. Paul had had divine preparation and now Felix was having divine preparation. And guess what? You've had divine preparation. It's not like you don't know anything about the gospel. You walk out of here today, you've already heard enough gospel to be saved, and I haven't even given the invitation. You've already seen somebody baptized. That means they've died to their old way of life. They are buried and they're hidden with God in Christ. They've been raised to walk in newness of life all because of Jesus Christ. You know that God loves you. There's no way you could say that God doesn't love you. He's been good to you. He's been letting you breathe His air for a long time. He's been letting your blood flow through your veins and giving you another chance. And He's brought you to a gospel preaching church. This is not a feel-good church. This is not just a come-as-you-are, leave-as-you-came church. This is a church that preaches the gospel and has for over a hundred years. And if we live until Jesus comes, we will continue to preach the gospel. Why? Because you need to hear that God loves you. And even though you're a sinner, God loves you, but you are a sinner. You have broken the laws of God. You do deserve to go to hell. The Bible says the wages of your sin is death, and God will require it of you if you don't have his solution. His only solution is his son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, free from a sinful nature, lived a sinless life, and then went to the cross. Though he had no sin, he died in your place. He paid the penalty for your sin. Jesus shed his blood as a propitiation as an atoning sacrifice for you. He stayed on the cross until he paid for every sin you have ever committed. And then the Bible says he was buried, but God raised him from the dead, and he is alive today, and he's offering you eternal life. But you have to repent. You have to turn from your sin. You have to believe all that I've just said to you about Jesus and receive him into your life. And the moment you do, you'll become a Christian. And God, God Almighty, has prepared you. You have heard the gospel. If you die and go to hell, your blood is not on the hands of this church or on this pastor. You have heard it, and some of you have heard it time and time again, but you've never found time for Jesus. And I'm telling you, today is the day of your salvation. I'm calling you out. Today is the day you're to say yes to Jesus Christ. You're not to put it off any longer. God has sovereignly and sweetly and lovingly given you divine preparation. But there's a second thing. There's also direct proclamation. These little preacherettes need to read what Paul preached. These little pretty boys that stand up and say, well, maybe this book is true, maybe it's not. Let me tell you what I think. I don't want to know what you think, preacher. I want to know what the Bible says. I don't need what man thinks. I need what God says. And boy, Paul laid it on him. But some days later, Felix, verse 24, the direct proclamation. <laughs> he arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewish He sent for Paul. He heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened. Bless his little heart. 
Drusilla was Felix's third wife. She was only 16 years old. He was her second husband at the age of 16. He had stolen her from another man. He had wooed her away from another man. She was Jewish in background. And it may be through Drusilla that he had his more exact knowledge of the way. Maybe Felix agreed to hear Paul preach about faith in Christ because Drusilla wanted to hear. Regardless of how it happened, Paul was preaching a powerful sermon. He was preaching about, verse 24 says, faith in Christ Jesus. And I want to t- tell you today, you get saved by God's grace through your faith in Jesus Christ. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's how you get saved. Romans 1.17 says it's all by faith. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You will not get saved by your good works. You will not get saved by how much money you give to the church. You will not get saved by how many times you've come to a church building. You will not get saved by your position in the church. Even if you're a pastor, you have to put all of your faith and trust in what Jesus has done. It is not what you do. It is what Jesus did. And what he did is die for you on the cross, rise from the dead to give you by grace eternal life and you can only receive that gift by trusting totally in him by trusting and say I can't save myself but what he did that's what I need and that's the only thing that can save me I put my faith not in myself not in my church but in the Lord Jesus Christ he alone is my salvation that's what you need to look for Romans 5 1 says therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But he was also discussing some other things. He was discussing righteousness. He was discussing the fact that he didn't have any righteousness and that Paul didn't have any righteousness in and of himself. He needed the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He probably shared with him Isaiah 64, verse 6, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, Felix, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. The best you can do, Felix, is not enough. The best you can do, the best split second you ever live is not good enough to get you into heaven. Your righteousness is nothing before the throne of God. And maybe... He also talked about 2 Corinthians, what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.21, that God the Father, he made Jesus, him who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He said, oh, but there is a righteousness, Felix. The righteous one, Jesus Christ, died that you might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He talked to him about self-control. No doubt he looked at him and said, you don't have much self-control. You stole that woman right there from another man. Where's your self-control? Just like John the Baptist went to Herod and said, and I believe that John the Baptist got right up in the face of Herod and pointed to his wife over there whom he had stolen from his brother Philip. Her name was Herodias. I believe he, he pointed right at Herodias and he looked Herod right now. John the Baptist didn't said, it is not right for you to have your brother's wife. And now here's Paul standing before him, no doubt saying something similar. And he's saying to him, you need to have more self-control. You're a leader. Act like one. You ought to be an example Don't give people a bad example by being married to somebody over here that you stole from this person. And then he talked about the judgment to come. That's the finale. He was saying, you may be my judge, but I got news for you, Felix. You're going to answer to a more exacting judge than you'll ever be. You're going to stand before God Almighty and give an account of your life. No doubt he quoted 
what he had said in Romans 14, 10, but you, why do you judge your brother? Are you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. No doubt he said what Paul said later in Romans 14, 12. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. No doubt he said in 2 Corinthians, what he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ Felix, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This was no sermonette by a Christianette or by a preacherette to Christianettes. Paul wasn't pandering. Paul wasn't placating this political dignitary. He preached a plain, strong, simple gospel message with spiritual truth. He didn't candy coat it. He didn't sugar coat it. He didn't give a feel-good message. He said, I'm going to preach to you the way I preach to everybody because you're no different than anybody You need to know about faith in Jesus. You need to know about righteousness. You need to know about self-control that comes from God. And you need to know that you're going to stand before God at the judgment and you're going to be in heaven or hell the rest of your life. Way to go, Paul. Billy Graham died this week. One day his son was asked, Franklin was asked, Do you preach a different message when you're, say, on a college campus like Oxford University than you do when you're over in Africa? Franklin Graham said, no, I don't because my father taught me the gospel is the gospel is the gospel. And so if I'm at Oxford, I tell them that God loves them, but they're sinners, they need to be saved, and there's only one way to be saved, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I have seen people, and my father saw at people at Oxford University in England be saved by the simple gospel. And if I go out to Africa, and I stand under a tree, and 7,500 people gathered together under that tree. I tell them the same thing. God loves you, but you're a sinner. Christ died for you. Jesus rose from the dead to give you eternal life. You must repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And just as it worked at Oxford in the university, the gospel works under the tree in Africa. There's only one gospel, and it's for all mankind. I don't change my message for anybody, and that is why we have lost a warrior this week in Billy Graham. But I'm praying for God to raise some more folks up that will preach the gospel, no matter if they're in a university or under a tree somewhere. It's the same gospel. It's the same gospel. Oh, hear me today. Hear me today, you don't change your message. You give gospel proclamation, faith in Christ, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Righteousness, your righteousness is like filthy rags before God. You can't trust what you do to get you into heaven. You trust what Jesus did to get you into heaven. Self-control, Yes, we make mistakes. If you've, if you've made a mistake, repent of it. Ask God to forgive you and move on. But don't keep making mistakes. Ask God to help you. Don't keep making the same mistakes. Stop. And then God's talking to us today about the judgment to come. I'm telling you, every person in this room, including me, we're all going to be in eternity within 100 years. And every one of us will be there forever, either heaven or hell. There is no other place. And it's all based on what you do with Jesus Christ during this short little time on earth we call life. No time for Jesus. No time for Jesus. Can't find time. When I find time, go away from the present. When I find time, I hear you, preacher. I hear you trying to scare us. I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to sow some seeds while I'm young before I get married. 
Leave me alone, preacher. I'm trying to make my way financially. Leave me alone, preacher. I don't want to hear all of that hell and heaven stuff. Just leave me alone. And when I get time, I'll trust Jesus. Well, let's see the last thing. We've looked at divine preparation, direct proclamation. Now let's look at Felix' deadly procrastination. Last part of verse 25, Felix became frightened. He said, go away for the present time. When I find time, I'll summon you. At the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he used also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor. Felix left Paul in prison. For two years, 24 months, probably at least once a week, Felix would call Paul in. And Paul would tell him the truth. And then Paul would go back to his cell. And he'd call him back in. Paul would tell him the truth. And he'd go back to his cell. And he'd call him in, hoping to get some money. Oh, but Paul didn't have any money. He was like Peter, silver and gold have I none. But I got something better than money. Such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ be saved. It went on for two years, two years. And Felix said, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time for your Jesus. I don't have time for the Bible. I don't have time for the Holy Spirit. I don't have time for the things of God. I'm an important man. I run a, a whole country, a whole area. They bow to me. I've got soldiers that do my bidding. I am very significant. I've got all the money I need. I've got a beautiful young wife. Don't talk to me. I don't have time. I bet he wishes he had time right now. He's been in hell for 2,000 years. What do you think he would say to you right now? Stop whatever you're doing and make time for Jesus. Thank you so much for watching this broadcast today. And I know that you've heard so much from the Word of God, and the Word of God is so powerful. But I just want you to hear one more time that God loves you. He created you in His image. He knows you, and He loves you with an everlasting love. That's what the Scripture says. But the Bible also says that all of us are sinners. We have broken the laws of God. That's exactly what sin is, breaking God's laws. And just like when you break man's laws, you get in trouble, there's a penalty for that. There's a penalty for breaking God's laws. The Bible says the just penalty or the wages of sin is death, spiritual separation from God. And even though God loves us, He hates sin. He loves sinners, but He hates sin, just like we love our children, but we don't love it when they disobey us. That is the way it is with God. And so God is holy, He hates sin, and He tells us because we are sinful, we're separated from Him. But He loved us too much to leave us separated from Him, so He came to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was born of a virgin, consequently, free from a sinful nature. He had always existed in eternity past, but He came to this earth through the womb of a virgin. And He was made in the likeness of men, the Bible says. 100% man, 100% God simultaneously. And the Bible says when He grew older, He was tempted and always like we are, but He never yielded to temptation. He never sinned. But even though He never sinned, He went to the cross and died as an atoning sacrifice for you and for me. And then he was buried to prove that he was dead. But I thank God on that third day after he died, Jesus rose bodily, victoriously, and eternally from the grave. And he's alive now. And he offers you eternal life. 
How do you receive it? Number one, you repent of your sins. You turn from your sins and you turn to the Lord by the help of the Holy Spirit. And then you believe that Jesus died for you and that Jesus rose from the dead to give you eternal life. And then you don't just repent and believe, you receive. You invite Jesus to come into your life. Would you like to do that right now? I believe that some of you would like to repent, believe, and receive Jesus right now. If you would, pray with me. Say something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. I am a sinner. You are the Savior. I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I turn to you, Lord Jesus. I believe you died for me on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead. I receive you now. Come into my life. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me. Thank you for being my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you so much for watching today. And may the Lord Jesus Christ help you to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. If you're in need of spiritual help, call us at 1-866-347-5431. There are caring people waiting right now to take your call. For more information about Bellevue, explore our website at bellevue.org, where you can catch up on recent messages from Pastor Steve and other great teachers through our audio and video on demand. And tune in to our live webcast every Sunday at 920 and 11 a.m. and Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Follow us on social media at Bellevue Memphis throughout the week for inspirational and encouraging stories. We'd also like to invite you to join us for worship this Sunday here at Bellevue. We're located at I-40 and Athlone Road. You're always welcome, and there's a place for your family to worship and connect. Check out Bellevue.org for a complete list of worship times. We look forward to seeing you soon.